So hello everyone and welcome to another conversation of the sixth cycle of conversations on corporeal architecture. My name is Marie de Pilat Freire and today I am very happy and honored to introduce you to Martina Fratura. Martina Fratura, class 2020 of the 40 under 40 lighting awards. She directed a beautiful light itinerant research spread in 10 different countries and which investigates the possibility of replicating the soft fascination states in built environments. Martina works as a freelancer in the field of lighting design and runs the think tank, The Beauty Movement, made of designers, scientists, artists, architects, and philosophers who seek the fundamental principles and impact of aesthetics. She is a member of the International Association of Lighting Designers, IALD, Women in Lighting, and fellow at the Center for Conscious Design. Martina, thank you so much for accepting this invitation and being with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. Hello to everyone in the room. It's a huge pleasure for me uh, to be able to, to be talking to you. And I'm actually looking forward to uh, listening and to receiving as many questions as possible uh, today and, of course, continuing also in the future. I will start with sharing my screen. There she be. Do you see the main one? You should yes. be able to perfect. So, I, uh, as you kindly introduced, I uh, decided to basically take the example uh, as a major part of my presentation on my independent research so far, um, which is a beautiful light, to uh, give you a bit of a, a, a grand vote, an overview of the way I, I currently act and in the Latin design. Uh, the industry. In fact, just to give you uh, also a background of what I do, I actually started as a light artist uh, or working with light artists in Europe and having my own project in Italy and abroad. So creating temporary light installation on site. And meanwhile, I was also uh, starting, you know, my way out in the offices and working within architectural lighting design. And to me, the combination already of these two elements were uh, was already very enriching because uh, I, I ideally I would say the reason why I chose light and lighting is it to me it made possible to uh, it's like a tailoring let's say uh, I would have considered something more boutique like it's a tool a huge umbrella that can um, uh, undertake many different paths but still with the human being at the very center. And just to give you as well, like the very solid um, building brick of this presentation and also of my uh, work, let's say, is I do have these two words, let's call it this way, uh, big and, uh, and um, on the top of my head uh, and in front of my whole world, uh, or usual, uh, always, which is beauty and light. Uh, I believe these two are actually very similar elements, uh, which are uh, together under the word of other term of permeability. So I believe this too uh, represents the state of permeability of our, of the human being. Both are uh, going like, uh, maybe let's say starting from what we can say the outer world and interfering or influencing or biasing or contributing to uh, to, us and to our uh, inner state. And I would say that this one has been always my uh, mm, feel rouge and uh, like motif, but especially after I have um, I got the pleasure you know to be uh, working and studying at the TUE uh, back for my master's thesis project. Um, and I was working with environmental psychologists and they themselves were actually working with light as a tool also for um, in that specific time, in the specific case, their research was burning on coming down uh, uh, people uh, in outdoor environments. For me, that was already very fascinating because um, I had 
back then I have I had had already some uh, experience even if a short one in architecture like in the offices and I was wondering how um like some of the notions that I was receiving from the psychologists were actually not really used usually in the offices which are the place where the majority of the of those Latin schemes were actually decided. And in this, in the department of human technology interaction of the TUE is where they introduced me to the non-image form and pathway and all uh, of the circadian and non-circadian uh, or acute effects of the light stimuli. Um, we can talk, for instance, about the work of um, Sachin Panda from the Salt Institute, his team is the one responsible also for the discovery of the um, uh, blue light sensitive receptors on, which, uh, on our retinas. So uh, all of this branch of knowledge, which was um, basically uh, starting from the fact that our, the light, light can go directly to uh, the center of our, of our brain, which is the subacus magnificus, uh, and it's actually the only stimulus which can, made me even more fascinated and uh, it kind of reinforced this, uh, the, what I was say, uh, saying before, which is I uh, could even more consider lighting as something that would have suit and fit to different type of scenarios. And I would say that I was lucky enough, and one maybe one of the reasons I even uh, went in this direction is this picture is taken by me around 5 a.m. last year, more or less around this, this period, because I um, I grew up by the Adriatic coast in Italy, uh, so the east coast, and I used to be able to watch the sunrise from the darkness of the sea and then changing on towards every color. And I remember even if one was quite young, so uh, we know, um, let's say, education whatsoever in the topic, I remember noticing the way I was feeling and addressing. Even though uh, when you watch the sunrise by the, the sea, it actually is quite a long process, way longer than the uh, sunset majority of the time, because it starts again from pit darkness. Then it creates a light of line and a line of light, and then these colors, as you see in this picture. Uh, so sometimes it could last even more than an hour. And I remember myself vividly still staring at this uh, phenomenon without really feel drained afterwards. Um, of course, by then I couldn't uh, I couldn't give it a name, but I remember even again still thinking, "Whoa." I wish I could be every day and every in every moment in a scenario like this. While usually, let's say, it's um, we, we know. I mean, every research nowadays starts from the incipit. that ninety percent of our time is or over ninety percent of our time is actually spent in those. And that was my let's wonder my question, my first research question to par, which is. Is it actually possible to recall that feeling that I was basically having out there looking at the sunrise in the indoor environment? Is it actually an ability of the, let's say, the environment, something that happens outside of me, which I have no control over it? Or is it something that is actually an ability of our own brain body system, as we uh, uh, believe or familiar with? And yes, so my uh, we of course what I'm talking about is the phenomenon of so fascination. So the ability of being uh, using our direct attention by in a like what it, I was called effortless way. So I won't be drained out by the act of staying focused on a specific natural object. But um, in my quest of understanding if that was actually possible in outdoor in indoor environments, I started to do first a semantic compar comparison. So if fascination could actually be related to what we might perceive as beautiful. And of course, I was back then uh, very uh, contaminated by the uh, 
quite spread uh, 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 stream of thoughts that says that is says that uh, beauty is actually a very subjective manner and topic, so very difficult to study for, and very less scientific compared to what a fascination could be. But um, imagine it to be instead under this vault, uh, this specific context where in the sun, in a church in the center of Italy. Would you not consider, at least closer than the previous scenario that I show in my previous picture, closer to the soft fascination instead? So, of course, like mm, that's when I start to get close to new aesthetics. Mm, Samir Zeki and Dr. Uh, Anil Chatter, uh, Chatter G are two of the most eminent professors in this regard. And um, this is, which is I, a uh, uh, speed made by Professor Luca Piccini. It kind of sums it up what is at least the very basic of what is called the static experience. So something which is not just um, uh, like uh, a perception of what is happening on those, or actually is not something that we don't have any control over it, but it implies a certain permeability because by the cognitive coding, we are actually apply our own uh, culture, our own experience our own memories and expectation on top of it. So you might say, but then that's what it makes it hyper subjective as a topic. I would still um, not completely, um, let's say, convinced about this. And uh, instead, I would have um, argued that there is something which is possibly to consider objective in the thread of, let's say, what is considered beautiful. Um, and if we consider this, not again, not something only that happens outside of us, but maybe a reflection on our own needs in a very specific moment. So in here is something very important to state, which I also believe it's important in, um, in the research itself, it's the variable of time. I would argue that in my research, I would have considered instead of subjectivity, the temporality of what you consider beautiful as a variable. Because what you consider beautiful now doesn't mean that it's actually consistently beautiful for you tomorrow. But still, that doesn't mean that you're chasing to consider that thing beautiful. It's just that you might need to look and focus on something else because it's mirroring your necessity better in this moment. That's why I decided to um, go for a tour. <laughs> so uh, my, I made the research itinerant. So going to 10 different countries and specifically in, in cities that were in different latitudes. Because at least I wanted to cover the fact that it could have been a matter of culture or a matter of climate. Um, also because, for instance, me being Italian and studying and living mainly in the northern countries and northern European countries, I was actually really experiencing a little of a uh, shift of what I would have considered beautiful in my own country and what I would consider beautiful in the countries that were hosting me, but with the different, for instance, climate conditions. And so I um, interviewed, um, like, uh, I, I wanted actually in, in all these countries to uh, try to um, um, try to cover or whatever we call like the uh, biases that the aesthetic experience, experiences will imply. And again, so with this in mind, so why did I do this? I would still consider, um, again, to make the semantic, let's say, correlation between fascination and perceived beauty, I would have, I wanted to check that the exposure to one's to a person beauty reference would help decreasing attention of fatigue. And if then that would have been enough, let's say, to help uh, responding in a similar way uh, compared to what is happening in when it's of fascination, it's on in the natural environment. 
So I, uh, in all of these 10 countries, I met um, uh, 16 participants and women and eight uh, men. The reason why you before you didn't see a full uh, uh, like a, a full number is actually because some of them were uh, had to be discarded because of too much of the noise of the restriction, uh, fortunately. Um, but we uh, I got actually inspired by um, um, environmental science. Uh, tests or so the ones that they usually perform out in nature and try to redesign them accordingly to be um, happening in those. So let me first tell you, um, of course, I'm aware that um, this is not a experiment done in a controlled environment, but um, there were specific traits that need to be um, uh, completely complete in order to be able to perform the experiment somewhere else. So, for instance, the size and the type of the room was the must, uh, the, the main goal uh, for, each, for each trip. So, the room would have been either with white or very light pink color with no um, uh, many things, or, or basically none that would have actually removed. Uh, hanging elements from the walls in order not to be distracting. And everything will be happening accord, uh, within their lunchtime according to the country in order not to be any and not to have any artificial lighting because my goal was not to be biased and or actually having any uh, excessive Zeitberg uh, before or within the experiment. So uh, the test was based in 15, uh, 15 minutes attention test divided in three different moments. The one, the first one was uh, more like a buffer zone. So something that would have helped in like in, in entering in the, um, in the, in the test uh, modality. Having basically two images which were always the same, one with a positive accent, one with a neutral, let's say, in uh, to be washed for three, 30 seconds each one. Then uh, I would have asked each participant to bring along whatever they would have considered their own reference of beauty at that time. And I would have asked them to look at them, uh, look at that emblem for five minutes straight without uh, trying at least as possible to um, uh, roam around with their mind. And uh, uh, the last moment would have been a uh, fast recall test. Basically, 10 letters would have appear, disappeared on the screen, and they were asked to type back at the end the one that they would have recalled better. And so the idea is that would have had a baseline or their own attention at that time, at the specific moment of the day. And then I would have compared that with in a maintained situation with their five minutes test with their own element. And this were the um, equipment uh, I would have uh, asked them to wear, which is a EEG uh, wireless headset, and in order to measure, of course, the electroencephalogram. And um, I wanted like the GSR device so to get their skin uh, humidity. Because basically my assumption was, first of all, for the GSR is I wanted to check if there, there, were, there would have been a stress release during the uh, five minutes. And then if, uh, again, in order to compare the studies with the ones done with environmental psychologists, usually out in the uh, in the natural setting and outdoors, uh, if with an encephalogram, if there would have been enough uh, beta enough activity in terms of uh, um, decreasing them, what is considered possibly my rumination and going toward, towards a soft. Uh, 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 scenario of soft vaccination instead. So I have to I start with let's say uh, let's call it failure instead of to, of course uh, uh, um, every data is a is a step forward. So the galvanic response was not showing any particular um, 
uh, result. Of course, in here, I, I'm just showing you a, a fifth city of Manchester, but of course, all the data were then statistically analyzed. And but this one, just to show you what it would be like a uh, more uh, average scenario, the um, galvanic response had never really shown a decrease of stress. Uh, or, or at least the diminishing of the uh, um, uh, humidity uh, of the skin. And the half frontal uh, asymmetry uh, was still actually not confirming uh, the hypothesis. So that um, an actual um, uh, beauty reference would have helped in that direction. But Instead, the better temporal asymmetry was always, or almost like all the time, showing an actual increase. And this uh, was what it for, for us uh, was also quite more like the actual uh, main objective because we would have, or the, also the previous study would have related that. To, not, uh, to actually keep on maintaining uh, man, maintainment of the direct, direct attention, but in a state of uh, not like not a draining state. So after analyzing statistically all this element, we could see or we could argue that a number of beauty compared with other selected attention tests could be related. To an actual increase of the symmetry of temporal areas of the brain. And uh, this would have could be associated with a type of bottom uh, attention mechanism. Of course, we might argue that the test itself, by being um, uh, showing and uh, asking like someone to look specifically at first two different images, which uh, was like the buffer zone or even actually asking to watch something that they bring uh, brought along, uh, it could still be both in a way top-down and bottom-down potential mechanism. So both involuntarily and voluntarily mechanism also uh, mechanism are almost joining in. But uh, because of the, um, especially uh, when it comes to the beauty um, emblem they brought along, because of all the association with the memory of the um, uh, of that emblem of the reasons them themselves for uh, why to choose at that specific moment uh, that specific object object as a reference for beauty, um, then we argue that the saliency of that emblem would that be almost enough to consider more a bottom up mechanism than the opposite one. So. What I wanted to continue doing in this direction is, if it's then possible, then um, the actual soft fascination mechanism is still available, let's say, or at least we are, uh, is it possible for us to reach a similar or a closer state than what we actually have once we are outdoors? Is this actually uh, helped by Latin scenarios. Uh, so what I mean with Latin scenarios, I mean like that when I normally work in order to draw and design uh, the indoors or the outdoor spaces with artificial lighting, um, we usually consider mainly the comfort of vision. Comfort of vision means having a certain light requirements uh, in terms of month intensity and output and color temperature of the light in a specific space. But um, because of, for instance, also the schema we, show, uh, we saw before, like because of all the non-image uh, forming pathway and effects related of the lighting, is it actually uh, possible to consider the light, light, lighting itself a mm, stimulus big enough to, um, to push in that direction. So to be able to provide it and helping a space to be actually useful in terms of maintaining direct attention in a effortless way.
Uh, we can't hear the sound of the video. Ah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I uh, this um is Professor Anjan Chatterjee, and this is a little uh, snap from a video, and is uh this uh, the beauty movement documentary. And what it's saying is, if you have to imagine a world where there is no beauty, most people will not want to live in that world. Uh, that why I'm putting this video in uh, inside uh, in the inside this presentation because even that like the question I uh, just uh, show you like before on this slide um, it was the main initial goal so understanding if actual light is able to trigger a state of uh, or closer to our brain is to closer to a state of soft vaccination in books for. What I did, um, with, or what I actually gained with uh, the ten, the, the, the tour to the this ten different countries while asking and talking to people about building their own idea of beauty was really uh, mind opening. Uh, because first of all, I started to notice how just by trying to explain to me, most majority of them, they were always very eager to explain to me the reason why they had chosen a specific emblem instead of another. And every time they were trying to describe their own beauty emblem, they were already changing posture, changing attitude with me because I would say 90% of the participants were uh, completely like, um, people that I didn't know before, uh, but that arrived and reached the experiment through university and uh, offices I was running the experiment at. And so even like the conversation with me was drastically every time changing from the first minute of the experiment till the end that in maximum slot would have lasted 30 minutes in total uh, in every country. And this made me think even more about this dualism of this, um, uh, I would say, one living organism of beauty and light uh, equation. Because um, the power of uh, having a foster aesthetic experience and uh, engaging and it uh, helped through light aesthetic experience was really changing the, um, the, the actual now moment each participant. So I wanna show you this uh, example because um, why I'm still, uh, I, I, would, uh, I would say, I would argue that in order to answer to if lighting can uh, help and foster, uh, a better like a state of fascination indoors and i uh, i realized that especially like according to the type of material that the space is in, is made of according to the type of purpose so there are a set of possibilities that we uh, try to implement every time and they are i would say always changing but there is one element that got in the equation that I, may, I believe it made the difference, which is awareness. Uh, in order to um, be uh, able to get to this um, state, especially through the experiment I had run, uh, it was not only the setting, it was not only the uh, element itself, but I would argue that it was their own um, tentative to uh, their own try to be um, focused in that specific moment, asking themselves also and repeating themselves why they had chosen that specific object as a beauty reference. And this element of awareness kind of stuck, stuck with me and I uh, tried to um, implement an indifferent scenario. What I'm showing is a case study, which is a, a, of a recent completion, which is um, it's called it's a project called Latin for Genoa. Latin for Genoa is a project uh, from the um, uh, municipality of Genoa, 
created by Fundiviso, which is a, a association uh, whose president is also one of the Latin designers of this project, which is Stefania Toro. Um, so Genova is a town in the northern part of Italy, if you're not aware. And its historic center is, um, is made of little uh, streets um, with a, a, a really non-linear plan. Uh, quite hard to roam, and also with a, uh, let's say, with a sense of security and safety, not really developed, actually, I would argue the opposite, and also a sense of belongings for the locals, really, really poor. Because especially in the in the last years, they claimed the actual historical city center who were actually uh, were under a, a decrease of uh, uh, security, safety, even cleanliness uh, of the streets and the walls themselves. So this project wanted to take. 10 uh, little squares of the historical city centers and illuminated them in an artistical way, but physical for permanent. So all this lighting intervention would have stayed in the actual town. So um, I would ask to um, illuminate one specific square, which is Piazza di Malebra, which in specific is the first one that you see. Uh, so it's the first image on the um, uh, left hand side. While on the right hand side is an adjacent uh, square, uh, which was given by uh, to another Latin designer whose name is Giuse Gallina. And so we decided, because we were very close, to actually work together under the same concept. And while we were talking, and I was uh, um, also sharing with her what I share with you about my research, we were considering this awareness as quite a key element to bring back also a sense of belonging for the locals and uh, true beauty. But that awareness, and if we link it to, again, to the moment of now, let's say, and this specific moment, we wanted to, and if we place that in the context of a square in a urban environment, of course, that is a bit like, um, uh, like it's a bit uh, complicated because you're supposed to transit it, maybe not to just stay. So we thought to, um, basically create in one square one main question, which is where do you see the beauty? Uh, proposing in a bench, so you can even sit there if you want, and you can, uh, or not, and this bench is also made of decorated film, so during the day it's still alive, and according to the transit of the, like, the movement, you're actually seeing it change in color while at night time it just illuminates to create a corner of light in a place that usually is not that illuminated. And the idea is that, because actually we explained this concept to the locals because we uh, made an extensive survey before, trying to, and actually we sit them together with them and their uh, uh, buildings meetings. Uh, to understand what were their priority, and that's when we uh, realized that there was an inner, um, let's say, uh, sadness about their con for the, I mean, from, from this on their side from for the conditions of their town at that time. So we sent out a question, actually this question, prior to the. Um, actual uh, execution of the project in order to get to, to gather some of the answers. And the answers were then used to create gobos to be projected in the next square. So um, during the day, you have the, where do you see the beauty with the decry film changing while it pass, uh, visible in one square. And in other square, you actually even have a um, permanent answer which is the one on top of the uh, that balcony, which is everywhere. So we suggest, uh, like, let's say, our favorite answer in a permanent way. But then at nighttime, while the bench in the Piazza della Lebra lit up, 
all the other answers from the locals actually start to pop in. What you see is a still image, but actually there is a dynamic scenario coming in, and that's where, which as you can see, uh, it hosts some tables and chairs because it's the square of a theater. So during night time, it actually gets full of people, and the letters get on top of the of the tables and the walls, so to create an actually quite interesting scenarios. And the feedback we have of this was that people were stopping by. People were stopping by to, uh, besides the curiosity, but really to answer that question. So that moment of reflection, there, of course, um, um, sometimes it, it might be uh, easier than other days, was actually helping to that awareness bit that I was mentioning before. And that helped us to, um, for us, it made us really happy to receive this type of feedback because of course, like it's it's also an evolving installation within the part of the answers because we are planning to every now and then to um, uh, include more answers and then change the actual dynamicity of the of the projectors in the square of Pasagambias. So I would say that if I have to sum it up, I believe that beauty is a means of relating. Of relating in which way? Uh, I really, uh, I, um, I would argue we are very biased on the fact that beauty is something that happens to us. So and it's outside of our, um, of our body, uh, of our control. So it's something that we have in front and we judge it as beautiful or not. I would argue it's not like that. It's a relationship, first of all, with yourself because it's a deep understanding of what you really need at that specific moment. Understanding if you're actually uh, looking for something specific. So in the act of searching for something, you are actually creating beauty. And because you are searching for what is your brain body system, uh, be in, let's say, in a, in a bit luck, let's say, in the commas in that specific um, uh, moment. And of course, once we uh, create that um, conversation with our own person, then we project that outside. And that's when also we start to, uh, to create even a deeper and uh, more uh, potentially meaningful relationship. So before closing up, I would just, before you ask me, questions i would just like to ask you one which is where do you see the beauty mm -hmm. thank you for your attention and for your question thank you martina should i re remove the share yes you can close the yes thank you so thank you martina for this uh, very interesting and beautiful uh, presentation. <laughs> I see that you are very passionate about this topic of beauty and of course uh, coming from Italy I think you are in many ways very lucky because you grew up with some of the most beautiful beauty in the whole in the whole world um, and uh, of course that must must also be one of the reasons why you are so interested and fascinated in this topic because if, if you're brain and if your body is already so used to all of this richness and com complexity and um, all the care and the aesthetics of every detail of the everyday you know not just the buildings but also the interiors and the the fashion and even the the food and the wine and all of these things of course but always being surrounded by beauty how could you not be so focused on beauty <laughs> but i also find it very interesting um, that you started your presentation by referring also to the biases around beauty and how when you selected these 10 countries where you would make your study, you also m went through this um, kind of personal investigation of um, to confront oneself with other um, uh, ideas of beauty uh, in the world and also to go through this experience oneself of perhaps in the beginning encountering something that we don't find beautiful 
but we see that others do and then it triggers our curiosity and then through these relationships as you were just mentioning through the relationship these effective bonds and deeper layers come and then we might start to perceive something that we could even maybe before find ugly uh, see the beauty in it um, so where do we see the beauty? Perhaps it's a work in process. Perhaps we can really see it everywhere. <laughs> we we don't know. We don't know. So my first question to you would be, uh, from your own personal investigations and your journey into this topic of beauty, and also because you have been involved, you just showed this uh, project in Genoa, uh, from your experience, how do you think that the, you know, the everyday citizen, the person who is not you know, working within a field of aesthetics, how do you think that they relate to these ideas of beauty? Do you, from, from your experience, did you do interviews? Did you talk to them? How do they relate to the idea of beauty? Yeah, absolutely. That's a super interesting question. And first of all, yes, I, I would agree with what you say. I believe that um, the context you were raised, it actually, of course, it, it helps to you to be able to look in a certain way. So, uh, but then I think that was also my stop at some point. I had to go very far away to realize that um, I was the first person super biased about beauty before being able to go back to study it. And the interviews I did with the people of the locals of Genoa, uh, way before, imagine that we started one year and a half before with the services, and we also created like a moment of conferences and in order to invite um, uh, the uh, people who are living close by, not just the one from our two squares, but everyone would have been interested in too. And we realized that, first of all, but that was also already the feedback I had with my own research. First thing is, so where do you see the beauty? First question, first answer is, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean is like, um, uh, what should I bring, for instance, was the uh, the answer, I would, oh, the question I had received during my research. What, what should I bring along? I was like, well, whatever you consider beautiful, I don't know. And that was already funny enough to me. The majority of all uh, the people I interviewed would have not been able to answer right away where you see the beauty. That's why, for instance, I know that in English it would be a mistake. I mean, you, the correct sentence of the question would be, where do you see beauty? The mm -hmm. reason why I had a the is, was actually in order to stress the beauty right now. It was to stress, again, the time variable, which I still believe is fundamental, because mm, you mentioned food and wine. So let's give, let, me, let me give an example, which is actually something that one of the uh, interviewers gave to me uh, to, to express their, uh, to explain their beauty reference and I found it uh, super, uh, which is, um, I have my favorite dishes. So usually we uh, prefer to eat something, like we have our favorite food or favorite dish, but we might not eat that every single day. Still, when we don't eat it, we, that doesn't chase to be our favorite dish. And so that person that explained to me was, uh, in this way, was trying to tell me that he would have asked himself if to bring that specific emblem of something that he would have considered the most beautiful thing in the world. But then it, back then he was like, I still consider the other thing which I haven't brought the most beautiful thing in the world, but right now I kind of resonate more with this object that I brought. And that is absolutely the beauty. Within the locals of Genoa, I, uh, while we were having a discussion during one conference there, uh, it was actually, you could see that they were um, in the process of readdressing their own concept of beauty. Because, for instance, at some point, one person that was at the beginning quite resistant, so she couldn't express what it would have been their own beauty reference, uh, her own beauty reference. She at some point said to me, hang on, I realized that once I saw that, um, because again, in Genoa, there are these tiny roads with surrounded by very high buildings. 
so I mean there is much this um, skylight, but not really sun directed going on unless you know sun going through some openings of, of the of the through the various building, so it creates line horizontal and both verticals. And she mentioned one of this line, and she mentioned the fact that. Once she noticed in a specific corner a, a line of light in that sense, she felt so connected to the space because she could find an actual angle that were that there was quite a, a private moment she had with the uh, with the city that she started to go back there more or less at the same time that specific season in order to go back to feel connected to that angle of in the specific angle of the corner of the town and to me that was pure poetry because again that's why i mentioned the beauty as a uh, mean of relationship because it's um it gets such a it's a very rooting moment if you uh, uh, you might say and so what i realized that in terms of city is the way you want to look at it it's always you noticing what you don't like. Our brain cling on it, right? We are aware that we can cling on negativity where more than way more than positivity as a default uh, mechanism, let's say, or as a default tendency. But the moment we chose to look on, like to, to discard instead that to look at something we can see the beautiful, that is also a training mode. Then you start to watch it more and more and more. That's still the moment you actually have been able to say it. That is in the way. Have I answered your question? Actually, I think I've depressed a little bit. <laughs> no, no, no problem. I mean, we, I, I am not looking to extract precise answers from you. <laughs> this is more. This is more also, you know, like throwing throwing um, logs of wood into the fire and just you know we, and then we we built we built through the sparks don't worry it's more fluid conversation really um so i also i was curious now with your description and i wanted to ask did any of the participants think about um, bringing a person or an or a pet for example a cat absolutely. or or a dog absolutely so i have been shared that slide uh, but uh, there were five sections distinctly uh, which helped me also um, realize that there was a left motif at some point. Um, pets was one of it. People. Then object of affection, there would have been quite difference between men and women. Uh, then there would be everything above the high side. Uh, and then, so, which I, I personally believe and then talking about also with a couple of psychology, they um, suggest that could be also related to the uh, act of looking up. So uh, opening up the chest so as an act of vitality almost. And then um, everything which had been a landscape. So as landscape, cityscape, actually something with an horizon. So uh, um, like, uh, like, mm -hmm related more to a vastity and easy access like open view those were actually the main uh, sections of the um uh of the objects and uh, to me especially uh, you mentioned the uh the biases that i talked about at the beginning um once i um so i in turkey and in canada Two different women, which they had never met each other, they brought the exact same object, uh, even though it was a personal one, but they made it to be very similar for some reason. Um, and they describe it to be the beauty, like their own beauty, because of the same reason. And I asked them to take a picture, and if they could, if I could keep an archive and all of that. And they took the picture in the very same artistic way. It was a bit <laughs> impressive. Um, and they were really, I mean, if you consider these two countries, um, they have, I mean, it's a completely different scenario in terms of climate, in terms of culture, in terms of religion, in terms of uh, social um, uh, manners. 
So it's, it was really, really interesting to see how the Rome Beauty reference would have been exactly the same one. And I would say that, that all of this uh, were really like points that made me start to go even deeper in the studies of this and how actually we uh, react in the daily life towards the aesthetic experience. Mm -hmm. And um, this is such a fascinating topic because I was thinking where could people also find beauty? It could be also beauty from the um, other senses. So it could perhaps be a perfume or, or a song or, or a film that they saw or, um, or also the beauty of an idea uh, of, of a concept, uh, even political, for example. It could be someone who is so passionate about a political idea who finds that beautiful, a vision to improve society or something like that. Did anything like that appear? Absolutely. So, of course, for the sake of the mm, uh, test, I had to... So, it's different from the, the Latin for general experience. For the sake of the test, I need, it need to be uh, visual because they need to look at it right so it was a, a, ten, a direct attention test phase so uh, it had some restriction but for instance someone was wanted to bring they said it is plain to see beauty in math so they print they printed our equation which is not the beautiful equation as uh, someone said and an equation is the one he loved and he had been stared at that equation for five minutes and he was really happy. I can tell you from the EEG. <laughs> and uh, I was like, okay. And that was fascinating. But of course, and then some uh, another person wanted to, he found beautiful, as you just mentioned, the song. Then, of course, in that case, uh, she decided to um, uh, print the lyrics. Of course, I have to be honest. In that case, it's a little, little completely different in terms of EEG response because we are working a completely different way. Not, it's not just looking, you are interpreting what you're, what you're looking at in order to match what is expectation of what you are seeing. So of course, i be honest with you, in the specific of these two cases, I have to dismiss the two, um, the result of these two tests uh, from the uh, statistic analysis. But, uh, they were really happy with that emblem that I couldn't take it from them. Uh, instead, from the Latin for general experience, the, the, what we collected, and I believe in that case, there was the bias saw. They knew how they were collecting for projecting those in the square. So I, and that, that we had this moment of reflection, of stillness involved that they were mainly prompting um, uh, emotions, like sensations, like, you know, uh, it was more like, you know, uh, when someone looks, when someone specifically looks at me, you know, like they were actually giving up input of something that they would have, that, that happened to them or they would have loved that to, happen to, to be happening again. So, of course, I think, I mean, the fact to be everywhere again and be a, a reflection of our own needs, it implies that it can be varying accordingly and according also to what is expectation of what you should be considering beautiful. So, for instance, in the test, by having specific and very precise um, instruction on what to do prior to the test and also what to, uh, what, what to bring, how to bring, like, for instance, uh, then they, they had some, they, they got restricted in this sense. For, and then in the case of the square, they were more trying to, to be poetic. To uh, one, one aspect that I find very interesting about the way you would, you would address the topic, especially with your hashtag, where, where do you see the beauty with this insistence on, on the the, is exactly this temporal aspect and how you work with it, relating it to the present moment. And I think this is very, very important, not just from a conceptual level, but also from an experiential level. And I can give you a very concrete example from my own experience that I experienced just yesterday, <laughs> which was I, I, I discovered a new band, a new band for me. They're not new. They are some of, some of the gurus of progressive rock. 
um, uh, Crimson King, may, probably Milton knows about them. And I discovered, oh, because I always loved progressive rock and I didn't know them. And I heard one song and I, I have, so I, I ordered the album. And then I remembered that my favorite band from my teens, which were the Smashing Pumpkins, also had a new recent album that I haven't bought it yet. And I wanted to listen before buying and I was very disappointed because I, I had this high expectation. I read that it was this amazing concept album and so on. And I thought, hmm. This voice now is not as beautiful as it used to be for me. And I had the opposite experience I, when I was growing up. I always found, for example, the sound of ACDC, specifically the vocalist. I would say, how can anyone listen to this screeching noise? And now if I hear it, all the hair in my arms and everywhere gets very, very excited and I absolutely love it. There's no explanation for this, but this is exactly uh, the whole, you know, the sum of experiences we have over our life that makes our bodies perceive beauty differently ac across time. And we have no control over this. It's completely personal and it can happen completely and uh, unexpectedly. Um, so you told me that uh, because I was thinking now how the the you know the skin getting uh, goosebumps and so is a, is a very physical corporeal response to to beauty in this case to to, to beauty of sound but it could also be beauty of, of other things. What kind of other measurements did you use? So you use the brain measuring. Did you also use uh, electric, um, so the, the skin conductance, temperature, what other measurements did you play with? Yeah, so, so far I only use the EEG and the GSR, so the skin conductance. Um, uh, I am planning to embark in a research and I am uh, this day uh, working on it, like uh, preparing to in, 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 uh, add more like to, to go multimodal. So uh, my my idea is to go for the high frequency rate to implement it and the high tracking to uh, uh, especially because if I want to stress in the vision and then uh, I would love to bring it to uh, the actual 3D dimension because so far the test I did basically was 2D so it was me in a room but watching at something and um, instead uh to consider the brain body system so at some uh, and uh, or, uh the sensory model so i would start with with my next research from the static triad um so and then uh continue in this direction so implement uh also these these factors in order to to actually measure the experience of the built environment um that's what will be the ultimate goal but then so far uh, i just moved with the eeg and the gsr and uh from from your experience and the data you have collected already did you already apply some of your uh conclusions to to the work you do for example with uh, lighting design absolutely yes absolutely yes because um I would say that so um, I relate more with the acute effect of lighting, so the non-circadian. So and what is the difference? And why the circadian takes almost a day, you know, of course, like to um, to make its um, its look. Uh, acute effects are almost immediate changes. So in arousal, excitement, mood, attention. So attention actually falls down in the acute effects of the light exposure. And um, I would say the direction of light. It's a uh, key to this. Uh, so besides the spectrum, besides the color temperature, of course, are always the um, uh, one of the main factors to 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 be controlling in specific environments. But directional light uh, is something that I realize it makes, and the for the high the like the high sight in the gaze, the way we directed it, uh, it turns to be a enormous important factor. Um, uh, Milton is here. I don't know if Milton would like to make a question. <laughs> I, I don't know if he's just maybe listening or he's on the go because Milton is like a, someone who is a lifelong uh, admirer and uh, studious person of beauty. 
Um, Maria, I'm sorry, but I missed the time for the start. So I'm just listening in now. Okay, okay, fine. Anyway, happy, happy that you joined us, uh, Milton. Um, so I, I, of course, I would have more questions. I wonder if there's any question here in the classroom. Does anyone want to make a question or a comment? No, <laughs> I, I was bringing it here to the class because we, we are working with an assignment here for the class that has a lot to do with this topic of beauty because we have been reappropriating um, discarded objects from the everyday, so basically trash from, from our consumption to create these models of the, uh, the concept is the dopamine city. So the city which is built Build, uh, build through all our habits of consumption and how we we get our dopamine kicks and our happy feels by engaging with the city also through these through these uh, objects and experiences and, and things that we consume and that uh, also exploring this relationship that we have with such objects because they first of all seduce us through their beauty so the the beauty of the promise of the experience of the sensation or and we also use this a little bit of an excuse to reflect on how brands work with color and beauty also to engage with us at different levels of uh, profundity and also we wanted to reflect on the beauty of the properties of the materials themselves if the discarded object is really an object without value or if it's there's still beauty in that object so i think this it's not by chance that this conversation is the last one we have because it's exactly now uh, a very good closing line. We have just been looking here at the models and, and having a conversation around this. So this is wonderful input also to reflect a little bit more different layers um, on, on experience. Um, I would have one more question before, before we finish, which has to do with... Um, from your experience also on this topic, because very often in these discussions around beauty, and you know that I'm also involved with these topics and also with ANFA and measurements, and there's still this kind of, I would say, old old way of thinking about beauty as something related to harmony and symmetry. And there's many people who also try to understand, you know, the, the principles behind beauty, because we, we have, of course, all the inheritance of, of classicism. And um, and we know that, in a way, this is, I wouldn't say the easy beauty, but what we universally, or the principles that we maybe universally would say more, in a more immediate way, relates to something to find it beautiful. But then we also have all those others, uh, other uh, interpretations of beauty that, that came, for example, with uh, Romanticism or Art Bruta or Art Povera, which I love so much, from from Italy. So would you like to make a comment on that? Perhaps your Italian uh, also sensibility, also not thinking about art of uh, What do you have to say about that? First of all, let me say that um, uh, more eminent people uh, uh, before me had uh, said that there is an, an inherited beauty in an acquired beauty taste. The inedited beauty usually it's embedded with the sense of safe security and also the, for instance, if you talk about aesthetic and you know uh, physical traits, the majority of that was also you know embedded to the idea of reproduction and to also back in time well, what it was considered healthy, so uh, also reliable you know in terms of someone that could potentially be a nice a good parent or a good partner, also health-wise. And I, of course, there is still all of that together. So if we talk about harmony and symmetry or symmetry, that is definitely something that our brain looks at and, and clinging on our safe and security um, and need. Uh, the acquired beauty, so the one that you get along with uh, throughout the years, that is uh, definitely the one that is more biased, it's time variable. And that reflects also, if we if you enter, as we were talking about in relation to what you are around and what is, what is inside, then I'd argue that uh, it's some, um, 
you're also reflecting, I mean, I wouldn't say the trend, but what it might be need also, not just for you, but for the people right, up, right, up, like right close to you. So in terms of art trends, there are so many uh, reasons why during the years there was a hard current coming in and out. Uh, back then, of course, was also related to, uh, especially in Italy, you know, there was... Um, the uh some establishment and religion come and decided also you know like the majority of the art pieces we have they're all they were all paid by uh churches <laughs> and, uh, back then and luckily they did because otherwise now we would have uh, many uh, way less um art pieces um and opera primas but uh, um i would say that it's um, it, I, it's not. Uh, is is it correct to believe that the the beauty is also harmony, and it's also symmetry, and it's also so everything that is related to what we could be inherited as a human being survival mode genre. But uh, what we acquire is still very much related to what are the needs at that moment. And they don't have to reflect and just, or they don't have to echo just our own needs. The being conscious of what you are uh, looking at. So for instance, just to go back, if I, if I may, to the example of the uh, Smashing Pumpkins album. Um, of course, you were going with some expectation because you were recalling a specific feeling back. But that specific feeling back was also generated by a specific input that was this, that set of songs, that time, um, with something completely new. So if you discard that input, you get an input that is similar just because it gets from the same group, but it has everything else different. Uh, it's really like a lottery. It might be sorting you the same effect, or might be complete, or might be sorting you completely up the the, the, the other the, the other direction. It, uh, unfortunately, is what it happened in this case. Uh, but it was literally like 50 50 percent. Uh, would it have been uh, maybe a way to prevent yourself from being, let's say, um, unsatisfied you know, from from your listening? Is being conscious again that what you're looking is not something that just to to resonate with what is happening outside of you. In this case, it's uh, like you're listening to, to something, so it's something that you have made you just uh, like press and play and listening to it. It's still being aligned to what is uh, your expectation at that moment. Yes. Am I making well, sense? Because I know it's a bit philosophical thing to go to go for. <laughs> I was supposed to be quiet because I was thinking. I was like in, in already going deep thinker mode because the same the same thing thing has happened also to me with some uh, perfumes, for example, fragrances. I, I I since the pandemic I got very interested in this topic because sometimes I would go to forest walks, you know, the what the things we could do, and one of the things that I found very very sensorially enriching was when people would pass by still with the distance you know the runners and people passing and I could smell their perfumes or sometimes the you know the 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 scent of the detergent in the clothes or the fabric softener or something and then I got into this and um and I made a kind of collection of the perfumes I had in different phases in my life and I went through the store and I smelled them and so on so I was going through this thread and I did have with most of them, I still have had almost the same experience because the formula hadn't been changed. But one of them, the formula was changed, and then I was very disappointed. So that really makes sense what you were saying with the expectation, because I wanted that fra to smell that fragrance, to anchor it at that specific moment in time. To me, that smell had all that universe in that time, and then I was so disappointed because I couldn't get it back. So I, I was looking for the Proust, Proustian moment in the <laughs> in the fragrance. Um, I don't know if you would like to make just a comment on this, on the uh, Proustian moments related to beauty. What, what would you say? Wow. 
<laughs> well, I believe that you said it all. Um, the expectation we have around the beauty, we already know. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a form of identification. Uh, when you get, when you, someone introduced to you uh, in, the, in self themselves, they basically go, I'm like this, and luckily I like that, as if it's a standard. You identify yourself with a specific thing. And it kind of also is, might be feeling diminishing to change at some point. Uh, again, there is no time variability with a possible for a possible day, it just it has to stay that way because you identify yourself with. Um, I would, for instance, with perfumes, I had um, similar uh, issues because myself, but I, it was not the perfume changing; it was me that changed. So the very same thing was not that nice any longer because for a specific period, I was response uh, responding to that perfume and uh until i the moment of acceptance that another type of perfume which normally would have been my favorite was the one that was fitting me the best at that moment it took a little while which was a very simple hack to do you know but i need to do like a, a check in time moment say okay now this one doesn't go so well with me this one goes very well and then allow yourself to be saying, okay, I will come and check later on in time. Now I shift back. So I'm now I'm back to the first perfume. And I was really happy when I could be doing this. But then I realized myself that allowing the pre previous one, I was happy the same. So this is just to say that sometimes the identification we apply to the specific moment, the specific traits of ourselves with some idea of beauties are... Um, are not like they are not really in for aesthetic experience. That's something else. That's taste. I would say I would make a quite a different, um, like a separation between beauty and taste. Like what I am interested in is aesthetic experience, and aesthetic experience is something overwhelming, but that's still brand new, very much into the moment. Um, taste is still my change, it's still my improvement. It, 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 it kind of expands if you let, if you let it to. Uh, but um, in that case, it's still like, it takes a little bit of courage, I would say, to check in with you every time and to see, is still, still, is this still suiting me? Is still this matching my expectation, but also what, like at, at the end is, you know, we work through predictability and expectation, right? That's the way we approach. And so, of course, we have that layers also for specific experience. But maybe, again, that moment of awareness to check in with you, um, to create that relationship to yourself first before to go to the surrounding environment, then maybe that's the key uh, for actually being using it in our uh, in, in our favor and not just be passive to beauty because that was also my like um, you can exercise yourself to see beauty everywhere the question is do you want to like do you want to be able to look at the bright side let's say if we want to call it a lot in a simplistic in a very simplistic way you know in a very reductionist in a reductionist way it's like uh would you train yourself to look at something that you consider beautiful because that will allow the creation of it even if there is not there right there right in front as like by default but you are actually creating you are putting your out there your own version of beauty and i think that is really powerful well that, that makes a lot of sense also with this whole you know investigation around perfume that i this is just my final comment because we are already a little over time Sorry. <laughs> just uh just to to finish um because when i went through this kind of um retrospective on the perfume collection um uh, this was also a, a kind of a conscious decision. It happened because I smelled one per, by chance and then I decided to do that because actually I was all, I always had one. I never had more than one perfume at a time. I always 
and and I never repeat it. It always had to be a new one. And whenever I smelled the ones from before, I would always say, oh no, I didn't, as if, and then I realized that maybe there was something in my way of approaching that I would never want to look at the past somehow. Oh no, no, I don't want to look there. I don't want to look there. And then I got curious about that. And then I decided that I would do it and see uh, what would come up, what the, the memories and all those things. And it was actually a very intense process in, in many, many things, because not all memories were pleasant. There were things, you know, growing up and feeling awkward as a teenager, all, all of these complete, many different moments, so many different things. But I did find it interesting that from the aesthetic experience, you know, all the thread of memories and the memories were all connected to places, rooms, people, experiences, um, all, all of those, all of those things. I had to think a lot about buildings and spaces and rooms uh, that came to my mind when, when I had all of that. So, yeah, um, I mean, it also makes sense that from the aesthetic experience of, of perfumes, for example, very often the notes and components are materials that we also have in buildings or uh, woods and um, even fabrics, uh, there's a there's sense of leathers and uh, velvet, even velvet and things like that. So, so Absolutely. much going on. I just want to add something very quickly, I promise, which is um, that's exactly it, because I believe that um, as a designer, uh, especially lighting designer, architectural lighting designer, I used, I, I was trained to give as, and to hand out as many lighting scenarios possible in order to match different needs throughout the days. Uh, throughout the same day, the different time of the, the different time of the day, um, which is absolutely um, a, a, absolutely a must, and and that's all good. But I uh, believe that the powerful aesthetic experience comes through the active action. The the and so um the idea that you can choose what you want the specific moment, not just because someone else has chosen for you, or because it's not just a nudge of the architecture. But because you can, you are aware of the impact that you are actually having on the space, and you are not, and not just reverse. That would have, uh, that would create a full aesthetic experience around you. And that's so. It's like every place you will be, that it, in a way you will have the power to turn that into your favor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's also nice to lose control. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the unexpected sights or whiff or hearing of something, that, that can also be really, really, really something. Uh, that, that's what I got when I when I heard, uh, I think two years ago, randomly ACDC on the radio and all my hair was crawling in the arm and I thought, my God, what happened to me with the pandemic? What did the pandemic do to me? <laughs> 100%. We have to finish for now because we are a little over time here. So... Thank you so much, Martina, for this wonderful, beautiful conversation. I cannot imagine a better way to finish the sixth cycle of conversations. Uh, this was perhaps meant to be the last conversation of them all. That was my original plan. But in the meantime, many people reached out and said, please continue with the conversations. Uh, so I think they will continue. They will go in a bit of a different direction. Uh, but but um, so I think this won't be the final final, but it's the final of this one. And thank you so much, Martina, for your contribution. Thank you. I hope it was nice. It was great. Mm -hmm. oh. Bye bye. Thank you all so much for showing up. Yeah.